The next area of the temporal bone that we're going to discuss is the jugular bulb. When we're talking about the jugular bulb, there are three major diagnoses that we want to consider. Paragangliomas, schwannomas, and meningiomas. Unfortunately, all three of these can be described as briskly enhancing masses centered in the jugular bulb. So how are we going to distinguish these three entities? We're going to use their effect on the underlying bone. And that means sometimes you gotta grab a CT if all you've got is an MR because the effect on the bone is critical to this differential diagnosis. Paragangliomas are aggressive. They erode bone and they do so in a particular pattern that we'll talk about. Schwannomas are much more polite. They remodel bone, they expand the bone around them. Meningiomas tend to induce a particular reaction in the underlying bone that we call hyperostosis, and it shows up as a spiky hair on end pattern within the underlying bone. Three very different patterns of bone involvement from these three different tumors. Certainly we can encounter other things in the jugular bulb much less frequently. Uh, metastases can affect any of the bones and uh, perineural cysts uh, can occur in the jugular bulb. They're usually not easily confused with the, uh, with the other three, although schwannomas are sometimes entirely cystic. This is a classic appearance of a paraganglioma in the jugular bulb. When they occur in this location, we call them a glomus jugulary tumor. Here is a lobular enhancing mass centered in the jugular bulb. Uh, the key finding here on MRI is the huge pipes running through the center. There is flow void here in a branching pattern. Nothing has big tubes running through it the way a paraganglioma does. Even among vascular tumors, this thing is insanely vascular. And so that's going to be our clue in this case that we're dealing with a jugulary tumor. Now, there is a particular pattern of bone erosion that we associate with glomus jugulary tumors. This is a coronal CT. Here's the jugular, bo uh, the jugular bulb in a coronal CT. Notice that the lateral margin of the jugular bulb has been eroded. It should have a nice cortical surface like the medial edge does. The lateral side's been eroded and there is a permeative pattern that extends up through the temporal bone. It extends so far up that it has knuckled up into the middle ear cavity and filled the hypotympanum. Now, if you look in through the ear with an otoscope, all you see is this vascular mass in the hypotympanum and you think to yourself, aha, it's a globus tympanicum tumor, but you're seeing the tip of the iceberg. Right, it looks like a glomus tympanicum. It's actually a glomus jugulari that got out of hand. We call these glomus jugulotympanicum tumors. This permeative pattern, the clue that you're looking for, that it didn't just arise in the middle ear, it arose down here in the jugular bulb and found its way into the middle ear. Just showing you the exact same thing in another patient to emphasize the radiologic appearance. Here's the coronal CT, nice intact cortex medially, permeative erosive pattern superlaterally as this tumor erodes up through the bone, destroying the bone. Look how much bone should be there. Destroying the bone and knuckling up into the middle ear cavity where it obstructs the round window and uh, is visible otoscopically. Remember, glomus jugulary tumors, like all paragangliomas, exceedingly vascular. And you can see on this angiogram that it lights up just like any of the surrounding vessels. Exceedingly vascular. We used to devascularize these before uh, surgical excision, but that's gone out of vogue. The MRI appearance of a glomus jugulary tumor has been described as a salt and pepper appearance. Uh, as with all paragangliomas. I'm not sure I really appreciate salt and pepper when I look at these usually, but I, I have this example in case you're wondering what the salt and pepper refers to. There's a white dot, a white dot, a white dot, a white dot. These are areas of thrombosed vessels. There's a dark dot, dark black dots from flowing blood, uh, 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 flow void. And those um, are those are supposed to represent the salt and the pepper inside this lesion. I'm not sure it's really that useful as a tool when you're interpreting these things, but uh, it is the right answer on the test. 
Here's a schwannoma. Schwannomas politely remodel the surrounding bone. These are two different patients, a coronal T1-weighted MR. With contrast, you can see it's a relatively small schwannoma, so it's uniformly enhancing. Nice, well-defined margins. Here is an axial of a somewhat larger lesion. You can see the heterogeneous enhancement pattern that is characteristic of schwannomas. And you can see how the internal carotid artery has been displaced forward as this thing expands, doesn't erode, expands the jugular bulb. Right, nice smooth bony margins all the way around. Here's another example of a schwannoma enlarging the jugular bulb. Nice smooth margin with the underlying bone, no erosions, although it's easier to see on CT. And this uh, tumor has heterogeneous enhancement pattern just like we expect for schwannoma. It's running from the lateral medullary cistern down through the jugular bulb right along the course of the vagus nerve. We might think uh, vagal schwannomas is occurring further down in the neck, but they can occur anywhere along the vagus nerve beyond its transition point to uh, Schwann cell myelination. This is a characteristic appearance of bone that has been invaded by meningioma. There are little spikes, spicules of bone extending up in all directions uh, off of the underlying bone, which sort of maintains its normal configuration. Classic appearance of hyperostosis compared to the normal side. Hyperostosis of bone tightly associated in our minds with meningioma. Here's the corresponding soft tissue window, and you can see the large, broad-based, uniformly enhancing mass with some scattered calcifications, classic for meningioma of the skull base, this one arising right on top of the jugular bulb. Remember that meningiomas like to be transosseous. A meningioma that starts within the intracranial vault will often spread through the bone and then extend down into surrounding structures. We see this all the time with meningiomas of the orbital apex that extend along the uh, second cranial nerve as uh, nerve sheath meningiomas. We see them also uh, at jugular bulb meningiomas that want to extend down into the neck along the neurovascular space. Right in the carotid space here, this is all meningioma extending 10 centimeters below the skull base here. Started up here, tracked along the neurovascular bundle into the neck. When you have any of these lesions arising in the jugular bulb, remember that there are cranial nerves 9, 10, and 11 and nearby 12, but 9, 10, and 11 running through the jugular bulb. When you have a mass in this location, you may injure any one of those three nerves, and you should look for the signs of cranial nerve injury. For example, here is the true vocal cord, and you can see that it has some fatty atrophy and has been medialized compared to its counterpart, right? That's vocal nerve palsy as a result of cranial nerve 10 injury at the skull base. But there's more. Notice the trapezius muscle and the sternocleidomastoid muscle on the unaffected side. Compare them to their counterparts on the affected side. You can't even find them. There's a little slip of a sternocleidomastoid muscle there, I suppose. I can't even find the uh, trapezius muscle here. Atrophy of the sternocleidomastoid and trapezius muscle from injury to cranial nerve 11 that occurred up at the skull base. Metastases, always on your differential because it can affect any bone. Uh, these tend to be very erosive, of course, and they tend to be erosive in a different pattern than the paragangliomas. We talked about glomus jugulari tumors that liked to extend superiorly and laterally as they uh, attempt to reach the middle ear cleft. Uh, metastases don't have that proclivity. They just uh, uh, grow spherically in any direction, and so when you see uh, erosions on all sides of the jugular bulb, less likely to be a paraganglioma. Think about the uncommon metastasis. 
Any of the nerves that run through the jugular bulb can give rise to a perineural cyst. These occur in characteristic locations um, right in the neurovascular uh, space, the post-styloid peripharyngeal space here, and they are completely cystic lesions. These tend to be benign, but can occasionally cause headache. And uh, if you're very careful with your needle, you can do a transfacial aspiration of these perineural cysts and make the patient feel better. That concludes our discussion of the jugular bulb. Remember the big three, paraganglioma, schwannoma, meningioma, and remember that you can tell them apart using CT based on their effect on the underlying bone.